Hello everyone, we are so glad that you have decided to join us for this time of worship. Whether this is something you do on a week-to-week -week basis, or whether you are here for the very first time joining in an Emmanuel service, we welcome you. And we trust that this time will be of encouragement to you, that it will be of challenge to you, that you will be blessed by it and through it. To that end, we encourage you to really engage what comes next to sing out loud, to pray along, to take on a posture of worship, maybe to raise a hand in worship as you sing. Um, maybe as you, as you go along and watch along to, to put an amen in the chat or yeah, to indicate that you're actively participating in this worship. May it be of honor and praise to our Heavenly Father. Now, as we begin this time of worship, I want to read from... Philippians chapter 2, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's sing together your great name. Who lost our sea, find their way at the sound.
Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for giving us your son. We praise you and we thank you for sending us your spirit so that we will never be truly alone. But no matter our circumstances, no matter how violent the storm and how big the waves, that you're with us to the very end of the age. We thank you and we praise you. Lord, as we praise you in song, may you be honored. As we praise you with our time, our attention, our prayers indeed, Lord, may you be praised. Lord, as we, as we give back to you of our resources, may you be honored. Help us, Holy Spirit, to, to give with a cheerful heart, filled with faith and anticipation, Lord, that you would use that which we give to you to your honor. Lord, that you would use it to, to grow your king, to, to accomplish what you have in mind. Lord, be praised in all that goes on, not only during this service, but in the days ahead as well. Lord, to you be all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's no doubt that the storm we find ourselves in continues to roar and we live in very uncertain times. At the same time, we have something in common in all this. We, we hold to a common faith, and the next song we're going to be singing is one of those creedal songs, a song that reflects that which we have in common, this faith in our almighty God, his son Jesus Christ, and the spirit that he has sent. Let's sing this truly together. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running and there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin in the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father. 
offering you sought to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for your sake you died. kids. Um, we're talking a lot about prayer this winter at Emmanuel Church. A lot of people in the church have history with prayer. They have prayed before, and, and most people, if they grew up with any kind of prayer, it might have been a prayer before and or after a meal, but especially a prayer at bedtime. And maybe that's how it is for you as well, that you say a prayer or possibly sing a prayer at bedtime. Well, that is certainly how I was raised. And uh, I remember growing up in Holland, singing a prayer before going to bed. I'm going to sing it for you. We'll put in some subtitles. You can't really sing along in English because that just doesn't really work. But this is, this is what I would sing most nights before going to sleep. Listen to this. Ik ga slapen, ik ben moe. Sluit mijn beide oogjes toe. Heere, houd ook deze nacht over mij getrouwde wacht. Nou, when I moved to Canada, and we had our own children, and of course we prayed with them in the evening. A lot of times we would sing our prayers, and we even taught them that Dutch song, but since you don't speak Dutch, we'll just leave that. We actually started singing the third verse of Away in a Manger. So here we go. That's the 
prayer, we would sing many nights before the girls would go to sleep. Now, we're going to sing another song during this church service. And we sang it a few weeks ago. It's called the Night Song. And I want you to pay real close attention to the words as we sing it. It's really a perfect prayer, a perfect song to sing before bedtime. So we'll sing it during this worship service. And I just we'll, we'll provide the link to the video in the description of this video. And, and you can play it again and sing along with it before you go to bed tonight. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with humble hearts to thank you for your presence, your power, and your provision. What an awesome privilege it is to approach your royal throne and commune with you, almighty God and creator of the universe. Please accept our gratitude and praise. We thank you for answered prayers and the countless blessings you pour out upon us every day. May we always be mindful of your goodness. We thank you for our online small groups and for the technology that allows us to continue to worship each week when we cannot physically be in the building together. We thank you for Pastor Swice and Kyla and all the dedicated volunteers who work tirelessly to put the services together. Bless and encourage them, Heavenly Father. We pray for our annual general meeting coming up next month, that people would be engaged and willingly do their part, making attendance a priority 
so that the necessary business of the church can be addressed. Father, we acknowledge that we have sinned, and we understand that it is only through your grace and mercy that we are forgiven. We are sorry, Lord. We know that you are grieved when we go astray. We repent and ask for your forgiveness, knowing with confidence that you will grant this request. And Father, during this lengthening time of COVID, filled with so many challenges, we need you. Oh, how we need you. We are discouraged. The world is weary and tired of fighting the pandemic, but the war is not over. Father, we ask for your protection and for wisdom and discernment in navigating through this difficult time. Please guide and direct our governments and health authorities in setting policy aid and assist church leaders leading their respective churches, as well as nursing home administrators, school officials, daycare operators, teachers and parents, help them in their decision making as they strive to do their best in the circumstances. We ask for strength and courage for our health care workers and we pray for proper rest for each one. For all those on the front lines going to work every day with the potential of disease all around them, please strengthen and protect them and meet their needs. And Father, we pray for healing for those fighting the virus right now. And we ask for strength and comfort for their families who may not even be able to be with them. For all those who have lost loved ones to the virus, we pray for comfort and healing as they grieve. May faith replace fear as we rely on the promises in your word knowing for certain that you are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. We thank you for the vaccines and the medications that have been developed to combat this disease. And COVID aside, there are many within our congregation who are struggling, including Evelyn, Alice, Kim, Jan, Darlene and Gerald, John and Jewel, and we lift them up to you today. We pray for healing and hope and that you would be revealed to each one in such a powerful way that they would be absolutely convinced of your presence and love for them. We humbly ask the same for others within our families, circle of friends and communities who have suffered loss or who are struggling, whether it be with health issues, mental health disorders, relationships, addictions, loneliness, fear, grief, financial hardship, job loss, hunger, or lack of adequate housing. Surround them all with people who care and who will comfort and encourage them, reminding them of your steadfast love. May they experience your peace. Father, we pray for our youth, children, and their families Bless them and help them to stay connected and grow spiritually. Empower our youth leaders to engage with and minister to this precious generation. Let us take your light into the darkness. Prompt each of us to do our part. We thank you for the opportunities that lie ahead. Living by the Spirit, may you work through us, spreading your love to reach a hurting world. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Today's reading is from Jonah chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You held me into the deep into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I, remember, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. 
that I with the song of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Well, friends, the goal of our current series of messages, of course, is for us to grow in our relationship with Jesus, both as individuals and collectively as a church, to grow in motivation regarding prayer, to grow in motivation regarding later on fasting, to grow through all that in, in effectiveness in prayer. And I want you just for a moment to imagine what that might look like, what the outcome of that might be. Can you imagine if we as individuals and collectively grew into a life of more frequent and more passionate prayer and more effective prayer? I mean, where we would be so in tune with God's will that we'd be praying according to his will and that our prayers would be answered and we would see people coming to faith on a regular basis. We would see uh, people experiencing greater measures of peace in the midst of the storm that we find ourselves in. We would see healings on a more regular basis. We would see God provide in most miraculous ways. Wouldn't it be absolutely wonderful for us to grow more effective in prayer, and would that in turn revolutionize our relationship with God? So we're on this journey. These messages are focused on prayer and later on fasting. A number of small groups are working through material regarding that as well, and hopefully you're engaging this process, this journey at home by yourself or as a family. I really hope you are engaging this and trying different things out and giving this a go, if you will. But I want to also caution you because at some point as you go on that journey, you are going to be faced with what you might refer to as the big question regarding prayer. The big question regarding prayer. And that is some version of this. Why doesn't God answer my prayer? Or why is God not hearing my prayers? You've probably wondered that yourself, right? I mean, I've heard a number of you talk about that just in conversations we've had. And, and I mean, it's certainly something that comes up in our small group discussions. And hey, to be fair, I've asked the question myself. And you know how it goes. You're praying for a loved one who's struggling with, say, a health issue. And you're praying and you're praying and you're praying day in, day out. And yet there doesn't seem to be anything. No answer, no change. Why is God not hearing our prayers? Why is he not answering our prayers? It's a tough question. It's, in fact, a difficult question, not because there are no answers. There are a number of answers. There are multiple angles to this issue. It's just that none of the answers truly satisfy, right? When we're praying for a loved one, we, we want to see an answer. We want to see a healing. So whatever the angle, whatever the answer is, it just doesn't seem to satisfy. Not only that, a lot of these answers seemingly just give us another question. They lead to more questions. Still, today I'm going to do my best to shed some light on this issue. We're going to look at two reasons why God may not be answering our prayers. Just to be clear, we're only looking at two reasons why God may not be answering our prayers. There are many other reasons. There are many other angles to it. If you want to grow and come up with a more profound understanding of this issue, again, I invite you, I implore you to join one of our small groups that's dealing with this. But for now, two reasons why God may not be answering our prayers. For the answers, these two answers, we're going to turn to the book of James, chapter 4. 
James chapter 4. You know the letter of James, the book of James, to be a profoundly practical letter, right? James forever dealing with these really practical issues, including the discussion in chapter 4. He's talking about quarrels and fights among Christians. I mean, it happens. You know it, right? But here we go. James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? <laughs> oh, James is pointing out the connection between quarrels and fights on one hand and our desires on the other hand. And you full well know that our desires, these desires within us aren't always godly desires, right? I know, I know, we are new creations in Christ through faith in Jesus. I understand that. We've been saved. We've become this new creation in Jesus Christ. But the old self seems to be right there. And there's, it sometimes feels like it's oscillating between the two, the old self, the new self. And so sometimes these old self type of desires well up within us. And these unfulfilled desires, we want... We don't have, and there we have the tension. Even within relationships, fights and quarrels ensue. The results are, of course, troubling. Verse 2, you desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. There it is. Now, I don't know to what degree this killing was literal, if that was actually something that James was aware of and he spoke into as he wrote this letter, or if it was more figurative, because we know it kills, right? These quarrels and fights within a church community, within a Christian community, they kill our joy. They kill relationships. They kill the peace that we can have in Jesus Christ. Well, the results of these quarrels and fights are awful. But then James carries on and he makes a statement that is oh so relevant to the issue we're talking about today. Why does God not answer our prayers? Here we go. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Oh, there you have it. Pretty black and white. Two reasons why God may not be answering our prayers. You don't even bother to ask. And when you do ask, you ask with wrong motives. Now again, we're only looking at two reasons why God may not be answering our prayers. There are many more, right? But these, I think, are often overlooked. So let's have a look at these today. We'll begin with the wrong motives one, because I think that's the easier one to understand. So we'll start with the easier one. Um, I, I think we get this, right? We, we understand that this just, holy, loving God would not, well, answer our selfish prayers, right? He doesn't owe us answers to selfishly prayed prayers. I mean, Jesus, in teaching us how to pray in the Lord's Supper, even points to that, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As he teaches us how to pray, he says, you make sure that you pray according to God's will, that you don't pray according to what you want, but that you put God's will first and foremost. Jesus modeled that himself. We looked at that just a couple of weeks ago in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, take this away from me if it's at all possible. But hey, not my will, but your will be done. Motives matter. Motives matter. So why are you praying what you're praying? That's a good question to ask. Especially when you're uh, looking back on the prayer, you say, why is God not answering my prayer? Is it possible that God's not answering your prayer because your motives are out of line with his will? It requires some real honesty to be able to step back from your own situation. 
I have to confess that this past week I caught myself in this. I knew Dr. Strang was going to have a news conference with our Premier Houston. And so in the morning I sat down and I was ready to pray and to write out some of these prayers. And I caught myself, it's like, why am I praying what I'm about to pray? And, and sure enough, it was really for my own comfort. I, I'm over it. I, I, I want to get back to some sense of normal, greater community. I think all of us are, right? So my prayers were, were really had nothing to do with what God's will might be in all this. It really had to do with my own comfort. I confess that, and it changed my prayer. Motives matter. I think we understand this at very basic we understand that God doesn't owe us an answer if we're merely praying selfish prayers. And so I just encourage you to consider your motives as you pray. To ask yourself, why am I praying what I'm praying? Or why am I wanting to pray what I want to pray? Consider your motives. Like I said, I think that's the easier one to understand. The second reason James brought up, though, that of not even asking, that not bothering to ask God, that's a more difficult one to understand. Right? I mean, why would we not even ask this almighty God, creator of heavens and earth, who is able to answer our prayers, to provide, to heal, to whatever it is that we're praying about? Why would we not even ask it's said that the greatest tragedy is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Let me say that again. The greatest tragedy is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. This past week, I read a fictional story about a, about a boy dreaming of heaven. And, and this young fellow, he, he found himself in his dream in heaven, and it was this this huge room, and the room was filled up with houses and vehicles and food and tools and healthy hips and healthy knees and healthy relationships. And he, and he says to God, God, what is all this? And God said, these are the answers to prayers that were never prayed. Just a fictional story, obviously, but the picture it paints is in line with what James says, right? You do not have because you do not ask God. You do not have because you do not ask God. I found it hard to figure out why we would not even ask, but there are actually a number of answers to that. There are a number of reasons why we do not ask God. Uh, the small group curriculum that we're going through with a number of these small groups point out a whole list of them. I just want to mention three of those that I think are probably the most prevalent reasons why we don't ask God. And the first one are cultural reasons. We live in a culture where actually we don't like to ask for help, where we like to make it look like we have it all together, right? Back in the day when we were still meeting here at the church, we would stand at the door and the greeters would go, so how are you doing? And 99% of the time, people would respond by saying, oh, I'm great. They put on a brave smile even when life at home is falling apart. We don't like to look weak. We don't like to ask for help. In fact, we're generally pretty quick to turn down help when offered. We live in a culture that values independence. The scripture, of course, presents us with a different value, one of interdependence. And you can see that in how the church is supposed to operate, right? All these different body parts connected. So we live in a world that values independence, where God's will is interdependence. And I think that cultural value of independence carries over into our relationship with God. And we treat God often as a last resort. The second reason why we may not ask God 
is our worldview, a commonly held, prevalent cultural worldview, a naturalistic worldview. A naturalistic worldview believes that it's really only the natural laws and the natural forces that operate within the cosmos. We might sit in church, we might believe in a God, but we actually practically believe that, well, it's all, this is just the way it works. There is, there is these natural laws. And it's very scientific, and there's very little room for the miraculous. And hey, if there's no room for the miraculous in our life, then why would we cry out to God for help? Why would we cry out to God to intervene in our lives? If we don't believe that there's room for that, actually. And so our naturalistic worldview may have really impeded on our prayer life. We're not even asking. We may not even really be aware that's what we believe because, hey, after all, we're good church-going people. We believe in God. But somehow, our secular culture with its naturalistic worldview has influenced us more than what we really realize. I encourage you to give that some thought in the days ahead. To begin to recognize that. Even when you sit down to pray, do you really believe that God can intervene here? That there's room for the miraculous. Cultural reasons, worldview reasons. Finally, the third one we want to look at today, probably the biggest one, you just quit praying. It's not like you weren't praying. You were praying at one point about this, that, or the next thing, but you gave up. Maybe it's because, well, you prayed and there was no answer, and so you grew discouraged, and you came to the conclusion, well, I guess it's not God's will. Or, or maybe you don't want to be disappointed and so you pray vague and safe prayers. You pray, Lord, uh, please be with so-and-so. We'll just leave it at that, because that way I won't really be disappointed. Or maybe you legitimately, honestly, don't want to become belligerent to God and continue to present him with your requests. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of the discussion regarding why God may not be answering our prayers leaves us with other questions. Well, here is one of those other questions, right? So we pray, and God doesn't seem to be answering. At what point do we quit praying about it, or do we keep going? Jesus, of course, spoke a parable, the parable of the persistent widow, in which this widow was looking for justice from an unjust judge. And she just kept hounding him, and she kept after him. And finally, the unjust judge, well, he didn't care anything about this woman, but he just wanted to get rid of her. And so he finally caved in and gave her what she was looking for. And the point of the parable is made clear in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. Always pray, never give up. There you have it, three common reasons why we may not pray. There are more, as I said before, join a small group and we'll grow your understanding in this area. Three common reasons why we might just not pray. Cultural reasons, independent culture, a naturalistic worldview where there's just little room for the miraculous, for God's involvement, and finally we just gave up. We were praying, but we quit. It's all part of these two reasons why God may not be answering our prayers. We didn't bother to ask, or we did ask, but we asked with the wrong motives, selfish motives, possibly short-sighted motives. Again, there are more angles to this, but none of them fully satisfy. They're still going to leave us with other questions. We're still going to find ourselves at a time where we're praying for a loved one with all sincerity, and we're going to find out that there is no answer, that God's not answering our prayers, at least not the way we would want him to. Yet sometimes he will. So why the one time and not the other time? 
There's most definitely a mysterious component to this. Yet this is clear. There's no mystery about what this text from James tells us to do. We are told to pray and to pray with the right motives. We may not be able to explain why God heals some people and why he doesn't heal others. But we do know for sure what we're called to do, and that is to pray with the right motives. Now, to help you practically process that, because this is really what we're after in these messages, right? It's not just more knowledge. It's a, it's, it's a changed practice, a growth in the way we live this out. I want to lead you through a short exercise, and it, it, it might be helpful to just have a pen and paper available to jot down a few things. If you have that ready, I just invite you to sit back, to relax, to maybe take a deep breath, to start with your eyes closed, and then to bring to mind a recent unanswered prayer. What did you pray about that doesn't seem to have been answered by God? Once you're clear on that, what we're going to call an unanswered prayer, I want you to think back to how you prayed about it. What, what were your motivations to pray for that specific request? Why did you pray what you prayed? reflect on why you prayed what you prayed, if you recognize there were some selfish motivations involved in that, possibly not entirely, but there was a, that was part of your prayer, I invite you to confess that in prayer. Just confess that to God and to pray your prayer with that in mind. Now, to deal with the unprayed prayer, I invite you to bring to mind a concern that you have or that you have not been praying about or that you have stopped praying about. What recent concern you're faced with have you not been praying about? identified that concern, consider for a moment the reasons why you didn't pray about this, or the reasons why you stopped praying about this. Finally, putting it all together, this concern that you're faced with, you haven't been praying about, now considering your motivation, keeping your motivation in mind, pray about that concern.
Heavenly Father, you have called us into a relationship in which we can come before your throne of grace and prayer. Lord, to pursue your will for our lives. To see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we confess that sometimes our prayers don't reflect your kingdom, but they, they reflect our kingdom far more. Forgive us for that, Lord. Lord, we confess that sometimes we don't even bother to pray for whatever reason. Lord, we, we treat you as a last resort. Forgive us for that as well. Lord, now for these concerns that we have, Lord, in keeping in mind our own motivation, which is often so influenced by the old self, Lord, help us to pray according to your will. Grow us in, in a healthier practice in this. Lord, that, that, that your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, encourage us in this. Help us to encourage each other in this. Father, we need you. Oh, we need you. We thank you that we can come to you in prayer. That this indeed is your will for your people to pray. Lord, remind us of this in the days ahead. May in, courageously then we, we come before you in prayer. And live out your will for our lives in that way. Lord, to you be all praise and glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's sing this wonderful song to be reminded that we can bring everything to God in prayer.
Thank you for joining us, everyone. I just wanted to encourage you to uh, watch our table talk on Tuesday. That comes out, and it's a short little video that uh, helps us process the week's message. Engage in that. Talk about it around your table and call a friend. Journal it out. Also, I wanted to let you know, uh, again, and a reminder uh, that the annual general meeting will be taking place February 13th at 11.45. Now, we are going to set up a Zoom meet for that the week prior as a test. So if you wanted to call in on that, that is February 6th at 11.45. Now for today's blessing from 2 Corinthians 13.14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the follow, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you again for joining us and may you be blessed throughout your week. God bless you. <music>